Um, I'm Jason McMullen. I'm an emergency and EMS physician at Cincinnati. Uh, work at University of Cincinnati for uh, our air medical system, air care, which staffs um, nurse doc as opposed to nurse paramedic or nurse nurse. Um, I'm part of the medical direction team for City of Cincinnati Fire Department and several others in the area. Um, but more importantly, I am a recovering EMT. If uh, my EMS career was a person, it could vote this year. Um, so I've got a, um, I've been it for a little bit. I'm gonna talk today about advanced end tidal CO2 assessment practices. Um, who here has end tidal CO2 measuring capabilities built into their monitor? Right. So one of the kind of one of my tenets for for medical direction and medical oversight and recommendation in the field is i hate thank you i hate leaving chargers in other rooms but more importantly i hate having a tool that does one thing right so like when we were faced with acls updates not too long ago and having to choose hmm do you have lidocaine or amiodarone well, from a medical perspective, they're roughly equivalent as far as the ACLS drugs go. Amio, I can only use for, um, for cardiac arrest. Lidocaine, I can use in cardiac arrest, but I can also use it for a little bit of topical numbing for my IOs when I, uh, to flush with lidocaine. So we're going to cover lidocaine. So I only got to stock one thing. Then total CO2, most of you should be using it right now to make sure that your tube is in the right place. But since you paid more than a car for each of your life packs or zoles or whatever you use, I'm going to teach you how to use it in more applications. This is not exhaustive. Most of this is conjecture and opinion, um, not based in, uh, not encumbered by fact. But we can talk about that too. My disclosure. Um, you are always amazed what you find in people's pockets when they come and see me. That is my boss uh, there on the right, and then my real boss, the charge nurse, uh, there in the middle. So, however, with this, I do have some conflicts. Back when Iridian existed, they're the makers of one of the uh, capnography uh, technologies. Um, I got to go speak for them on occasion. All stuff that I, uh, I designed the talks and everything, they just paid my way. Um, they then were bought by Covidian, and they were just bought by someone else, so that's not an active relationship. And then I'm most proud of, I won one cherry Coke off of a trauma surgeon on a bet about capnography. So <laughs> that's, that's how I've benefited from this. So we're gonna talk about the basics and what really is entitled CO2, because if you ask folks, hey, do you know entitled? You're like, oh yeah, I got that. And then you start talking and you realize that, well, maybe not. So we're gonna base it in the foundation of the way that I teach my, my medics. Um, so then we have a firm platform to go forward. And then we're gonna talk about it in several different uh, disease processes. Hopefully we'll get through all of them, but at least by understanding the basics, you'll learn how to apply it to all of them. And it's gonna include cardiac arrest, trauma and TBI, sepsis, uh, dyspnea, a little bit of DKA thrown in there too, I think. We gotta break this down absolute Barney style. Right, to make sure that we're using the same language because some people get a little bit confused. Capnometry is the measure of exhaled carbon dioxide, simply the measure. It can be a qualitative measure, which is your easy cap, right? That purple, bad, good as gold type thing. Um, that's an instant pH changing, color metric, um, endotracheal intubation confirmation placement device. Still has a great use. I still advocate for using them after every intubation because you get results with that in one breath as opposed to need to wait for a couple other breaths. Then you can have quantitative capnometry, <coughs> which is this here, right? So which is this here, which gives you a number. And there's even semi-quantitative, one of the ones that we used uh, on the aircraft basically told me that it was between 30 and 50. That's pretty useless, but it gave me a little bit of quantitative uh, aspect instead of being able to see my entitled CO2 is 34. Now, that's different from capnography graph. It's a drawing, right? So this is entitled CO2 on the y-axis against time here. Gives you a nice waveform, just like an EKG and everything else that we are used to looking at. So capnometry still has a role. Capnography has pictures to it, and uh, both have a use for what we're going to talk about. Now, in tidal CO2 measures the concentration of carbon dioxide in exhaled breath at the end of exhalation. 
fundamental, right? But it's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. Because in order to get that measurement, you have to have cellular metabolism, right? Your body has to be alive. You have to have perfusion to get from the tip of my finger to my lungs, and then I have to be able to ventilate to get it from my lungs out into the monitor, whichever one that you use. So knowing that you have to have metabolism, perfusion, and ventilation to get that number or that graph, you can now interpret that number or graph along these three variables. If you remember nothing else from this talk, this is one of two things, that alterations in ventilation, perfusion, and cellular metabolism will affect end tidal CO2. Meaning if you have normal end tidal CO2, you probably have normal ventilation, perfusion, and metabolism. If you have abnormal of one of those, you will probably have an abnormal CO2. So when you're confronted with an unknown patient, an unknown situation, and you get a number that is abnormal, now you can start to think about why. So let's break these down into those three points. And we're gonna start with metabolism. Any science geeks out here? I see some vigorous nods in the back. Okay, this C6H1206 plus six oxygen molecules gives you carbon dioxide and water. That is life. Sugar plus oxygen spins off energy, carbon dioxide, and water. This is how you breathe in, breathe out, the circle of life, all is good. And this is the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. This is important in ways that you'll see in just a minute because this is how CO2, CO2 is related to pH. We're gonna to get to this, okay? I promise. This is probably the most nerdy slide on here. The rest is kind of crude and humorous. However, this is the meaning of life, which means that you have to be alive to make end tidal CO2. Perfusion, right? If your heart is beating, then it's going to take the carbon dioxide that's made by the cells that are alive on the tip of your finger all the way up and into your lungs, right? Miracle of life. If you have cellular metabolism, if the cells are alive in your finger, but you have no heartbeat, you have no perfusion, then you're not going to get out there to off gas. Can you think of a clinical condition where this might come into play? Right, we're gonna talk about them. And then with ventilation. God hates straight lines, right? If your EKG tracing looks like this, that's bad, right? What do you call it? Come on, you gotta speak up so you can be heard on tape. Asystole, right? Asystole is bad, no one in here wants it. If your capnogram looks like this after you intubate someone and they are not yet in asystole, they will be, all right? So at the most basic, you have to have this, right? We're gonna talk about it a little bit more. And then you also need to monitor, not just that one time check, but over time, because this is an atrial tube that's in the right place, in the right place, no longer in the right place. If you do nothing else, this is absolutely mandatory. A little side note of um, conversations we had with the fire chief association locally, when we wanted to finally mandate Endotracheal tube or supraglottic airway placement, whatever advanced airway placement, must have entitled CO2 attached. And there were some agencies that still had not upgraded and did not have capnography. Like, well, you can't force us to do that. We can't afford it. It's not next year's budget. I said, well, I can help you in both ways. We are going to do that. And then I'll save you money in your budget because why don't you just give me all the, all the longer scopes and all the endotracheal tubes that you don't have to stock anymore. It's that important. In my opinion, if you put a tube in someone's mouth of any kind and you don't put capnography on the other end, no one will defend what happens to that patient. If something goes sideways, no one will defend you anymore. That's how important capnography is. That's why your chief should buy it. Now we're gonna talk about how to use it. Here's the second most important thing, right? If you have perfusion, ventilation, and metabolism in place, then you're gonna have your end tidal CO2. And if all of those are normal, you can use end tidal CO2 
as a corollary for what's active in the body, which is the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. This is what we measure. This is what is physiologically active. So we're taking a leap of faith that this represents this when it comes to things like that henderson haxelbach equation, all right? I'm going to say it again because it's that important. Alterations in ventilation, perfusion, and cellular metabolism affect your end tidal CO2. That's what you got to remember. Now let's talk about it. Who here has done CPR? Right? Who here knows that the last time they did CPR, you ran that resuscitation to the absolute best of your ability? Couple, right? How many of you are lucky enough to have the pucks and the feedback devices and all this other kind of stuff that predicts everything. It's coming, right? I think that one of the makers is at Zoll that now has the puck and the see-through CPR, but because of where you gotta put the pads, you can't use it with the Lucas. Ones you can use with the Lucas, they don't have this technology. Nothing's perfect, right? But I'm gonna tell you right now, if your monitor has entitled CO2 in it, we're gonna talk about how you can guide your resuscitations. Right? This may be the most immediate practice changing that you do right now. And we're going to break it down. Right? You can use end tidal CO2 from a metabolic standpoint in some ways to determine is this person on which you're doing CPR equivalent to this table? <laughs> All right? Is that dead body really dead or, like Monty Python, not quite dead yet? Now, there's early literature early literature from CO2, uh, with entitled CO2, that said, if you are less than 10 on initial measurement or less than 20 after 20 minutes, dead body, don't do it anymore. You know when that evidence came out? Yeah, old, pre-2005 is what you really need to know. Back when we used to not really pay attention to compressions and not really do CPR and do all this other kind of stuff, so now that we're really doing CPR a lot, when's the last time that someone did not have less than 20 after 20 minutes? We're routinely calling people in the field with end titles in the mid-20s that are asystolic just because there's good compressions, right? Now, in order to get that, there has to be some metabolism. So if you're faced with one where your end tidal CO2 is declining or is low and stays low, does not start to improve once you start resuscitation, then probably there is a level at which resuscitative efforts are futile. You're gonna see in just a little bit as we kind of progress through here on why end tidal CO2 by itself should not be your only marker. Because I can tell you, I had a live patient talking to me whose end tidal CO2 was less than five, one of my last clinical shifts, all right? It's not voodoo, it happens. However, if you have low end tidal CO2, recognize that it affects cerebral um, uh, body metabolism, cellular metabolism, so no metabolism, no end tidal CO2, dead body equals table, okay? How else might we affect cellular metabolism in the setting of cardiac arrest? It's my favorite ACLS drug. Bicarb, right? The big yellow ugly box. In my opinion, other than electricity and CPR, of course, this is the best cardiac arrest drug out there, right? I stand in the very, very small minority. Recognize, though, that if you are using bicarb, because this is H2CO3 and you look back at that henderson hasselbach equation, that this is converted to CO2 in the bloodstream, right? It is. So if you, you know, if we're doing CPR on this table and I push bicarb into it, what is going to happen to my end tidal CO2 level? It's going to go up. Now, the one thing that comes with it, when it goes up from this, from bicarb administration, it will stay up briefly, a minute or two, maybe three, but then slowly trend back down. Most of the time, it's a very quick push, mainly because, in essence, you're giving a really small quantity of sodium, a very small quantity of bicarb into it. So you're going to off-gas it or distribute it pretty quickly, right? Small transient bump. Side question. In your system right now, 
running a cardiac arrest, do you have someone who is a code leader that does not touch the patient, does not perform any task other than standing there and being the conductor? Here, I can't hear it quite back. Nope, I understand. So heard perfect world. None of us are in perfect worlds. Um, there are some situations, and this is all a dynamic type of thing, like any rescue situation or any call. One of the hardest things to kind of get over is when you have six people on the scene. So you've got the two on the ambulance and the four on the fire truck, and you've got six. Arguably, you could have someone who is out. I, I haven't been in that many other trauma bays, but I can tell you in mine, uh, where I work, you can tell that the, the, who the most experienced person is the attending physician either for emergency medicine and or trauma, and that we stand at the foot of the bed away from the action just watching the action happen. Even though each of us independently would probably be the best person to do X, Y, or Z task, so you can watch. One of the things that's important is that you have that one person who knows that person A pushed by carb so that when person B sees a spike in entitled CO2, they don't misinterpret it. That's the only reason I bring it up. Perfusion is the other big key. Let's face it. Cardiac arrest resuscitation is all about the compressions, and compressions are all being done to try to perfuse the heart and brain, right? That's the purpose of it. If you look through here, does anyone use, um, this is from Physio's CodeStat um, products. See, Sam use it, all right? From here, the colors bled out a little bit. This is, each one of these is a minute, each small block is 10 seconds, each little line going down is a compression. This is from my system last month when I was putting this together. And you can see on, here's a 10 second pause, three second pause, eight second pause. You see all the compressions, bop, 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 bop. Overall, this is a pretty good tight density compressions. Each compression starts to move uh, the blood forward, which gives you perfusion, right? Now, the life packs do not have the little hockey puck that some of the others do that tell you too fast, too slow, too hard, too light, incomplete recoil, doing a good job, right? They don't have that feedback. That's okay. You don't have to go out and spend on upgrading your monitors or buying a separate item. You can use your entitled CO2 because if you're doing good compressions, from a perfusion standpoint, you will see a maintenance or an improvement in the end tidal CO2 simply because you're doing good compressions and moving blood from the perfusion aspect. That makes sense? No? Yeah? So if you are the co yes, ma'am. Is that why you have a higher capnography reading if you use a device? Is that why you have a higher capnography reading when you use a Lucas? The answer is I don't know because I have zero firsthand experience with a Lucas. Um, I can tell you that when you have someone on the chest who looks like they're doing a good job because it looks like they're moving well, you will see an entitled CO2 go up. So as you're the code leader, right, we all want to say every two minutes, we want to give everyone their turn. That person that you're resuscitating doesn't care if this person does CPR for 30 seconds and you hurt their feelings because you get them off the chest. This other person who's doing a good job stays on for five minutes. They just care about the perfusion. So as the code leader or whoever's looking at, or yourself, if you're limited and you have the person on entitled CO2 and you're doing compressions, when you get on the chest, if you start at 24, keep going, right? And make it a video game, make it a challenge. When I finish my cycle, this needs to be at least 24 or higher. And the next person on the chest needs to make it the same or higher to maintain that level of perfusion. Does that make empiric sense? Yes, no, maybe so. The other way that you see with perfusion is with what we're really aiming for, and that is with ROSC. With closed chest compressions, you're really only doing about 20 to 30% of the heart's normal work. You will never be able to generate the standard cardiac output from compressions alone. This is why as you're doing compressions and maintaining entitled CO2 here of about 20, it's already labeled for you, that here it's spiked up. And when it spiked up quickly and maintained, that was ROSC. 
So this can be an early marker of rust because even the stunned heart as it starts to, to beat again will be better than your closed chest compressions. And more importantly, who here has run into the frustrating situation of you get rust back, you start going, you know, or you wanna go from the bedroom to the rig and the rig and oh crap, I lost the pulse, right? And you're trying to feel it this way. When you're using your entitled CO2, as they start to lose their pulses, you will see that measure start to dip down again. Now to the point of where you say, all right, I remember that when I was doing CPR, their end auto CO2 was 24. They got Ross back, it's now 44. And now it starts to go from 44 to 40, to 36, to 32. Uh-oh, it's your trigger that you can objectively see and say, we're losing him, right, for the old colloquialism, fuel for a pulse and get back on CPR quicker because you now have a monitor. If you're relying on cardiac rhythm alone, and they're in PEA and go to normal sinus, you can't use that. So ROSC and fail, ROSC and fail, ROSC, and then the end. Yes, sir? So what, so what would you do if you've got normal CO2, uh, so you believe you've got ROSC, uh, CO2 is maintained, but you can't feel central pulses, but the CO2 is maintained? So I have a body with a number that is within a normal range, but without a palpable pulse. I would call that PEA and initiate CPR. How do you explain the PEA if they've got normal entitled CO2? They must have metabolic activity. They must have otherwise they wouldn't be able to maintain CO2. So there are, um, the other leg is ventilation, which we'll get to, <laughs> right? The other is ventilation, in that with all three legs of the triangle, all of them affect the others. So you're looking at a summation that can be normal, right? Um, so whether that person is retaining, the other thing, to, here, let me just cast that back. The use of a normal entitled CO2 is a relative term. For most of us in the room, as we sit, it, our entitled CO2 should mirror our PCO2, which should be around 35 to 40. However, we all have patients that we take care of on a too often basis that are retainers. There are really bad COPDers who don't have great exchange at baseline. And when they die, they're even in their normal, healthy state, their entitled CO2 could be 60, 70, right? Because their PCO2 in their blood is 80 or 90, and they're talking and walking. So if that person drops from a, their normal of 90 into a normal range for you, you might be, that might be a red herring. Does that make sense? Sure, but if you've got CO2, you must have flow. Yes. Yep. You must have flow. Whereas if people pulse, the central pulse, that's what makes you fly flow, that applies pressure. So if you've got CO2 maintained within roughly normal limits, 45, You probably have some flow, but I would argue from a, just from a, a Barney style, I'm you know, from South Carolina, this has to be simple kind of thing, that if you're not feeling, if you're not, if you don't have a pulse here, then you're not having perfusion here, which is why I would do CPR on that person because it, the other, again, is simple. If you have someone who actually has perfusion, right, actually has perfusion, and you can't feel a pulse, and you do CPR on them when they might not need it, do you hurt them? Not really. Maybe you crack some ribs, but not really. If you have someone who has no perfusion and really needs CPR, and you stand back for 10 minutes and debate it, will you hurt them? Yeah. So that's why you know, I will reflect back and do CPR in, the, in that kind of case until I can explain everything else. Because the evidence behind here, I cite what I know. There have been no citations through here yet. So I'll talk about ventilation a little bit. Who here has, has esophageally intubated the patient? Yep. If you haven't done it, it just means you haven't intubated enough people yet. There is no sin 
in goosing a tube. The only sin is in not recognizing it. You should not kill anyone, right? You should not. It's a lot of paperwork for all parties involved. There's no great sin, there's no sin greater than not recognizing a tube. This is the utmost time where you have to, have to, have to use your entitled CO2, right? This is something that you never want to read on an autopsy report from a pre-hospital arrest or pre-hospital resuscitation. And a tracheal tube located in the esophagus. And I've had to do that and had to have that discussion with my medics. And they say it was in place, but you go back and look at the waveform and there is none, All right? So that's where you got to know it. But the more important way is trying to figure out how to bag and doing it right. So in the setting of cardiac arrest, what is the respiratory rate? 10, right? 10, that's easy, which means once every how many seconds? Right, to our friends from London, is that still the same in the metric system? They, they are not laughing, I'm sorry. Okay, so I need a volunteer who has a watch with, with a second timer on it. Who's gonna be a volunteer? Okay, yes sir, here in the front row, loud so the people in the back can do it. I want you to clap, and six seconds after that, clap again. Wait another six seconds and clap again, All right? All right, anyone get a little bit uncomfortable even though we're all sitting here nice and safe with the bag him, right? It is slow. I guarantee you that I have, on my last resuscitation attempt, over bag someone. I have hyperventilated them. When I stand back and, you know, from the, from the edge and help guide a cardiac arrest resuscitation, my most common repeated feedback is, Slow down, slow down. Because hyperventilation has serious consequences, has serious consequences. And one of the ways that Capnometer can do is to help make sure that you're doing it correctly and at the right pace. So we use LifePak 15s. I'm not advocating for them versus anyone else. This is just what I use and what I'm familiar with. On here, everyone should be looking at the monitor. Of course, the rhythm is important to know if they need defibrillation or not. This number, which is your capnog, which is capnometry, this is your end total CO2, and this patient is a normal 35, this is important um, for your perfusion status and a, kind of an ancillary marker of how adequate are my compressions, and is an easy sign of ROSC or loss of ROSC. So if I'm up there and I start at 35 and 15 seconds in, I'm down to 30, I know that I am not doing a good job on compressions and I need to fix it. The other is the person who's managing my airway, who has the bag, I have them look at this number, that 15, because that is a respiratory rate, a true respiratory rate, and that each one of these boxes is an exhalation, and there better be 15 of those a minute. If you're bagging fast, these do not lie. So it's a, all right, you're on the chest, you're doing compressions, I want you to make this number 100 to 110, I want you to make this number as high as you can, you're bagging the patient, that number better be between 10 and 12, plain and simple. Because you recognize that you may be doing stellar compressions, but if she is doing, if she's over bagging, what is this number going to do? It's either going to go down or his benefit is going to be masked by her harm, right? Because the better perfusion you have, the higher the number should be. But the more you exhale, the more you hyperventilate, you're going to drive the entitled CO2 down, and they may cancel that part of the equation. So it's when we're certainly, during a cardiac arrest, in the short time that you have, cellular metabolism is not going to change that much. So unless you give bicarb, that's going to be a constant. And then if you make respiratory rate a constant. The only variable in the equation to come up with this number is compressions, which means that you can use this as a marker for how good your compressions are. This is where I teach and use it the most.
Questions about cardiac arrest and entitled CO2? All right. How about this time-dependent diagnosis? This is a CAT scan. Those of you who were in my last lecture, um, let's see if you remember. So CAT scan to be a neuroradiologist. White is, blood is bad, all right? So can anyone diagnose this problem? Yeah, lead poisoning. So how do you manage this patient? This is not a cardiac arrest patient. They may need to be intubated and have their airway managed by you on the scene. So how are we going to use capnography? So yeah, these are bullet fragments. Here's a going through. This is not good. So here's what you got to know. We talked a whole lot about it in the, in the last, uh, last session. One millimeter mercury change equals a 4% reduction in cerebral blood flow. You drop their end tidal CO2 by one, you drop the blood flow by, to the brain by 4%. Because in the blood, carbon dioxide is a um, great regulator of vasomotor tone. So the blood vessels that are in the brain respond to CO2. Higher the CO2, they dilate. Low CO2, they constrict. All right? You buy me? So normal, normal is 35 to 40, 45 right? If the person is herniating, which means that they're, they have so much blood and swelling in their head, they're actively squeezing their brain through the bottom of their skull and you cannot put it back. We want to do everything we possibly can to save that brain. And to do that, we can, because we cannot make the skull bigger, we try to shrink the volume that's occupied by the blood vessels in the brain. So if we can take all the pipes, make them from here to here, then we save some room for the brain to stay inside the skull. But with the trade-off, right? Smaller pipes, not as much flow, not as much oxygen and glucose delivery to all of the brain, not just that at risk. Which is why in the setting of herniation, we say you can hyperventilate them to bring them down a little bit, right? Bring them down a little bit, but we only want to move it by five or less. So to go from 35 to 40, down to 30 to 35. Because here's a math pop quiz. If I drop your end tidal CO2 by five points, how much have I reduced your cerebral blood flow? 20%. That's a bunch, right? I look back and think about all the people that I have hurt because just like in cardiac arrest, we hyperventilate. If we're handbagging someone, it's our nature we're going to hyperventilate them too, <coughs> that we're going to deprive them of oxygen. Now, we'll say that this still holds true in your cardiac arrest patient. So one more reason not to hyperventilate and to, to have a targeted rate of 10 is that recognize that with compressions only, your cerebral perfusion is low because your cardiac output is low because external chest compressions aren't awesome. But now if you're... If you're um, making it even harder to get blood flow to the brain because you're shrinking the vessels that are feeding the brain. You may resuscitate the heart, but you have not perfused the brain. And that's gonna be your person who's not going to have a neurologically favorable recovery. So pay attention to your ventilatory rate in TBI and in cardiac arrest for these patients, All right? And recognize that in the TBI patient, if you're not herniating, the blood vessels still shrink. So you've got no reason to, to do this as a treatment. You just do it because we get excited, we're not paying attention, whatever. We are still contributing to total cerebral hypoxemia, all right? If you look at this, right, this is from the San Diego uh, TBI RSI trial done uh, a decade or so now. At patients with uh, severe TBI who arrived in the emergency department, either intubated in blue or non-intubated in, um, so intubated is in red, non-intubated is in blue, and what their CO2 was. These patients who were intubated all came in, or the vast majority came in 25 to 29, whereas those who were not intubated came in within a normal range. So this is just evidence that they got tubed, they got overbagged, right? that all of these people, some of them may have needed it, but all of these people had 
decrease cerebral blood flow during their pre-hospital stage after intubation. Hyperventilation is assassination if that patient is not actively herniating. It's a broad statement, but it's true. When you look at these are, this is evidence from um, pigs in a lab where you can anesthetize them, intubate them, put all kinds of sensors in their, uh, in their brain. And you look at respiratory rates that are either driven by an arbitrary number, six or 12, or you target it to maintaining a normal range in total CO2. You can see that moving from six to 12 moves you from 45 to 30 in your in total CO2. Big difference, a 33% reduction in your end tidal level just by going from six to 12. Whereas if you try to target it, you're pretty successful. All right? You say, well, who cares? When you look at the amount of blood that's delivered to the brain, moving from six to 12 drops you way down. Way down. If you target to a normal, you stay with normal blood flow. This is measuring um, uh, PTBO2, so the brain tissue oxygen saturation through like a, they call it a Lycox monitor, right? So this is measuring the actual oxygen delivery to the brain itself, right? And then overall cerebral perfusion, right? So this is more CPP, respiratory rate of six, respiratory rate of 12, and with a target in total CO2, right? Believe me now, use in total CO2. Now, what do you do with the person who comes out of this accident, who's got a GCS of six, who's not protecting their airway? It's easy with a TBI, because in a TBI patient, is there, should there be anything wrong with their lungs? Should they be in hemorrhagic shock? Do they have any real alterations in their cellular metabolism? No. If you remember that, that big triangle, if all those other things are normal, then your total CO2 and PCO2 are normal and pretty reliable. In this case, what do you think about their lungs? Yep. So, I mean, big blunt trauma, they could have pneumothoraces, they could have pulmonary contusions, they could have hemothorax, they could have any number of things, right? Chances are they've got a femur, a liver, or a spleen, or something like that, so they're in hemorrhagic shock as well. So your perfusion's gonna be off, your metabolism's gonna be off, which means that your whole end total CO2 is going to be off. When you look at CO2 as simply a marker of perfusion and hemorrhage, this is from an animal model where they instrumented them, measured their end total CO2 and their PCO2, and then bled them down. And you see the difference that these numbers are no longer close enough for government work, right? It works in pigs, it works in people. Here's another one where it looks in people of severe trauma that says, use of entitled CO2 as a ventilation guide in trauma patients with significant base deficit, which is a marker of acidosis, has poor correlation. And best shown is here. So these are patients with severe TBI, where they looked at their measure of entitled CO2 versus PCO2. And this is the difference between them. This is plus minus five, because if it's within five, you're probably close enough. These patients had no underlying acidosis as a marker of hypotension. They had no hypotension itself, and they had no, um, they had no lung injury or lung problems. The three sides of the triangle are all equal, so this measures up pretty well, which means that if you're trying to keep their entitled CO2 at range either to prevent hyperventilation or to use hyperventilation because they're herniating, you can use those numbers accurately. Everything's nice and tight here. You see they're not nice and tight. In fact, half of them are outside of the range. And this, the way that this is, that means that half of them were between 10 and 20 off, which is the definition of not reliable. All of these patients had lung injury, acidosis, or hypotension. So in your polytrauma patient, your end tidal CO2 no longer represents the carbon dioxide in your blood, which means that trying to use it as a marker for hyperventilation and everything else 
the, the wheels just fall off the wagon. Yes, sir. There's my vulgar slide, sorry. Um, I, I thought I had the answer to that one in the pocket. So my, so my recommendation is, is this, right? So normal, 35 to 45. If you're not herniating and it's isolated TBI, keep it there, right? Herniating, drop down by five points into the 30 to 35 range. Only as long as you're herniating. And if they start to improve, their pupils become reactive again, whatever, stop, right? Because you're, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul for it. There are plenty of patients in the setting of trauma that are intubated and their very first intotal CO2 level is 20. It is absolutely wrong to not bag them to let their intotal CO2 come up. Because in that setting, that intotal CO2 has very little bearing of what the actual blood value is. So in that case, my advice is to keep it the same. So if they start at 20, set your bagging rate to keep it at 20. Or even better, if you're RSIing the patient and they're breathing on their own beforehand, start with how they are doing. So if they're, if they're breathing 30 times a minute, then maybe they need that to maintain. So follow the patient first. Try to keep your number stable second, because then at least you make it a fixed variable instead of just hyperventilating, because we know that hyperventilation is gonna be wrong. And if you're forced to hyperventilate because you're herniating in front of you, aim for a delta of three to five. There is zero science behind that. That is my advice and my opinion from how I understand it. And if anyone has any better ideas, please share with the group. Now, let's talk about DKA, right? Now, patient comes into my emergency department with critically high blood sugar. And there is a hunt on for diabetic ketoacidosis because uncomplicated hyperglycemia means eh, we'll get it down to a reasonable range. We'll encourage you to take your medication. We'll help you with follow-up and out the, door, out the door you go. DKA, I book you an ICU bed, right? I mean, big, big difference on where you go. Do you come in? Well, is your elevated blood sugar? I got to draw blood to see if they've got decreased bicarb level on their metabolic profile, their electrolyte panel. I get a blood gas on them, see if they're acidotic. See if they got ketones in their urine and then ketones in their blood. Multi-step process. This takes, you know, assuming that they're able to pee right away, this takes me uh, about an hour-ish from the time the blood leaves the body until I get the results, which means an hour and a half-ish after the person hits the bed do I see these numbers, All right? Hour and a half taken up of time. You can do it faster. You get an elevated blood sugar on finger stick, and they got a decreased entitled CO2, the threshold is somewhere around 24 or less, there is high probability that patient has DKA and not just uncomplicated hyperglycemia. Now let's think about why. There's hints right here. So what does the A stand for in DKA? Acidosis, right? Acidosis that Henderson-Hasselbach equation, right? If you think about that, acidosis equals decreased CO2. As the pH changes, so does the CO2, all right? If you've got less CO2 out here because of altered cellular metabolism, you're gonna have less CO2 in your lungs. The second fact of that is that most of your sicker patients with really bad DKA, they have um, fast respirations. What's the eponym for that? Cusmo, is that right? That's the, that's the deep, hard, fast? Yeah. So deep, hard, fast. Now if we all, and, and if, you, if got, you wanna go for fun, go hook yourself up to uh, capnography and, and you'll watch your numbers go down, right? So I'd argue that in the back of the, in the, back of the squad or even in that person's kitchen, you get a, an elevated blood sugar 300 is all it's got to be, and uh, entitled CO2 of less than 24, that person's in DKA. Now someone say, Jason, so what? 
Oh, I'm glad you asked. This has got to be interactive, guys. So, because, I mean, with DKA, there's no treatment on the field, right? It's always got to go to the ICU. Well, there is treatment. And there is safety with this, and there is advanced assessment of your patient with this. If you can identify that potentially critically ill patient earlier, start their treatment earlier, then you're going to keep them from decompensating because there is some threshold where a DKA patient just falls off the cliff. So if you're able to identify it 45 minutes before they get to the hospital, when you take about your scene time, your transport time, which is in reality two and a half hours before I recognize it with the way that I have to do things, you can start your treatment way earlier. And the initial treatment for DKA is really big fluid boluses, like two liters in an adult before you move to the next steps. So you come in the door, you've already identified them, you've already got their two liters in. Now I can see where they kind of re-equilibrate after, uh, after we play their volume status, and now I can get them on their way to the advanced levels of care even faster. The other more important one is this, right? More important one is this. The sick dka -er is sick, ultramental status, easy to identify. The mild DKA patient who's at risk of doing that in, uh, in a few hours looks to be okay. Now, I work in a busy urban system where there's a huge supply-demand mismatch. And frequently or not, it may happen every now and then, and some of you probably know of someone who may have done this, of the, uh, you don't really want to go to the hospital, do you? Would you, what do you think about, do you think maybe you should, or maybe you could just call your doctor in the morning so I can, you know, go back to my station and sleep because this is my 17th call today, right? I know that you don't do it, but you can probably imagine someone that you know has done that. Well, if you go out for an elevated blood sugar run at three o'clock in the morning, I, I can't blame you. And that person comes into my emergency department, I have those same inner feelings. But there's a difference between a blood sugar of 300 and a normal entitled CO2 and a blood sugar of 300 and an abnormal entitled CO2. And you might say, all right, it is 3 a.m., it is snowing, this is run number 17, you need to go to the hospital, right? You need to go to the hospital now. Here's my nudity, let's talk about sepsis, right? Now that is obvious. Is anyone not gonna transport that to the hospital? No, right? But with this one, what is this? Huh. It's a big abscess, it's probably MRSA. Right, the uh, colors wash out a little bit in this bright light, big ring of erythema around a pus pocket, right? And you're like, you called an ambulance for that? Now clearly, this person needs medical attention, but do they need it from me and my ambulance and do I need to give you a ride right now? It, these inner thoughts happen, right? These inner thoughts happen. And again, the answer is maybe. How can you get more information? Because this person can come into my emergency department, be seen in my fast track area, and be home in less than an hour. Or this person could get admitted to my ICU. Big difference. So let's figure out how that's done. To understand sepsis, which is what we're talking about, the definition of sepsis is SIRS, the Systemic Inflammatory Response System, plus infection. Some word math. Well, you see that big spot on his back, so that's the infection. This is SIRS. SIRS is at least two of these. That's elevated body temperature, 100.4 or, uh, or higher, or hypothermia, so 96.8 or lower. Heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, or CO2 less than 32, and then there's some white blood cell count measurements. How many people here can measure a, a, do a CBC in the back of your ambulance? Nope, there's no point of care for that one, so can't have it. Otherwise, you can diagnose these, right? Because you gotta have at least two of them. The reason why sepsis is the definition of this plus infection is that if I were really, really nervous, um, I, I could be tachycardic and a little bit tachypnic. If I ran a 5K, I would be tachycardic, I'd have an elevated body temperature, I'd have a respiratory rate that's up, and I would probably have a white blood cell count just from the stress of, of running when I'm fat and out of shape, right? 
Is there a relation of blood glucose in this? So the answer is not in the definition of sepsis. Um, if you consider glucose by itself to be a stress marker, you can see that elevated glucose in any pathologic condition is associated with worsened outcomes. That is true in TBI, MI, stroke, sepsis, right? So it's on the, the twofold, and especially in patients who are non-diabetic by history who have an elevated blood glucose um, in the setting of whatever physiologic stress. So this is SIRS. My units carry um, uh, uh, thermometers. Do other people's? Yeah, this became really important. People had to dust them off with this whole, you know, have you been out of the country in the last 30 days kind of, kind of question. People got really interested in taking temperatures again. So you can diagnose this in the field, right? Sorry about that, duplicate slide. Severe sepsis is blood pressure less than 90 or a lactic acidosis. So who here has a point of care lactate meter? I see one, right? They exist, they have been commercially available and last I heard that they were going to be no longer available. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a nod in the back. Yeah, they just went a big market. However, do you have a point of care acidosis measurer? Yeah, in your entitled CO2. So in, um, for me, in the emergency department, I diagnose sepsis with a thorough history the thorough history and physical. I go looking for the infection with a chest x-ray and a urinalysis. I do all the blood work. I do all the blood work that's needed. So got to check that renal panel again, look at that bicarb. I got to look for the acidosis with a blood gas. I get a lab lactate and all kinds of other stuff that takes me hours to get. Or you can diagnose it with history, vital signs, and entitled CO2. Because their entitled CO2 is going to be low for two reasons. One, the metabolism, that acidosis part of lactic acidosis. And the second, from a perfusion or shock state. We've got two reasons to have an abnormally low entitled CO2. That threshold has not been well established. Some friends in Orlando working with uh, Orlando's EMS agencies are building a huge database of how to interpret this. The number again is gonna be somewhere probably around 25. And this is in a non-intubated patient, just like your DKA patient. So non-intubated patients with abnormally low um, CO2s, you have to look for why. And we'll close out with this guy, right? Who here is 100% confident in your ability to accurately diagnose the cause of the patient's dyspnea in the adult? Yeah, me neither, right? Me neither. This device right here, so BiPAP, CPAP, has probably saved so many lives and more importantly prevented us from doing harm than anything else that has come across in the last decade. The reason why is this. Um, if I think they have CHF, but they really have pneumonia, and I give them Lasix. Have I helped or have I hurt? Hurt, right? If I think this is COPD with wheezes, but it's really Rawls from CHF, and I give them a lot of albuterol on the way to the hospital, have I helped them or have I hurt them? You see a little bit of a question mark? Hurt, right? So think of, and I'll explain, CHF, congestive heart failure right? The heart is failing. Think acute MI with every CHF exacerbation because there's a reason why the heart is failing and dying heart muscle is one of them. The biggest determinant, or I guess infarction, is when the oxygen supply does not meet the oxygen demand. We on the track so far? The biggest determinant of myocardial oxygen demand is tachycardia. And what's the side effect of albuterol? Tachycardia, all right? Tachycardia. So now you can actually look at your Capno graph. This is normal. So this is your inhalation phase, A to B. This is your start of exhalation. Get a rapid climb, because this is simply the concentration of entitled CO2 being measured across time. 
You get to this point, you kind of reach a near plateau and then slow rise to the ultimate part and then drop off, all right? Here, you see it kind of cove off. This is not the best picture. I'll show you another one. But you can look at the actual morphology of the wave more so than the number to get some clues of what's happening inside. Because let's think about bronchospasm. What happens? What makes you wheeze? Okay, so I'm hearing constriction of the airways. Which airways? Your bronchioles, right? Now, in asthma and COPD, <clears throat> do all of them constrict the same amount? No, it's patchy, right? You're gonna have some areas that are worse off than others. And is it easier to blow through big or little tubes? Big. So what you have is as this person starts to exhale, they empty their bigger and more clear airways first. And then instead of getting them almost all out of the, at the end, right, it starts to kind of come over to a slow out. So here's your out and here's your wheeze. Until finally, all of those other uh, bronchioles and uh, empty out, the alveoli empty out, and you reach your total end total CO2. I guess there's a better demonstration here in just a minute, but just understand that that comes from it. What is wrong with your airways in CHF? So there's fluid in the lungs, but what's wrong with the bronchioles? Nothing. Nothing. So what do you think the capnogram should look like? It should look normal, right? Now, here's a series of patients, uh, excuse me, a series of capnogram tracings of a patient with a COPD exacerbation. You can see here, the CO2 number is low, right? So it's abnormally low, but you're, you can listen to the patient. You can see them in respiratory distress. You're not suspecting DKA or sepsis or anything like that. You're focused on dyspnea. That's how you're using this tool today. And you see this, this bump up and then this slow climb before it goes down. This looks like a shark fin somewhat. They get a treatment and now it starts to really open up. This person may actually wheeze more, they may actually sound worse, because remember, to make that sound, you actually have to be moving air past enough to generate turbulent airflow, right? It's that turbulent airflow which makes the sound that you're hearing. If they're not moving enough air or enough air fast enough across the obstruction to make that turbulent airflow, you don't hear anything. This person may actually sound worse, but you can look and say, oh, they're getting better, right? They're getting better. Now, to answer one of the questions of, you know, kind of, you have an abnormally high CO2, this can be one of them. They've been retaining because they've been unable to ventilate themselves for a while. Now they open up, they've got enough pent up CO2 in their bloodstream that has not been able to off gas yet, that is now off gassing. And then after several treatments, they start to become normal again. Kind of cool, huh? This is a CHF patient. Now, CHF is one of those tricky things where, again, you're going to want to look at the shape and not the number. There have been several papers that have been unsuccessful in conveying the message <clears throat> of trying to help provide some decision support based on the capnometer, so the number, instead of the waveform. The number can be unpredictable because a patient with really bad CHF who has an exact, uh, ejection fraction of 10, by definition, they have poor perfusion, they're probably going to have lower entitled CO2s as compared to the person who has normal function, uh, which may have higher entitled CO2s. So I advocate for looking at the shape of the waveform. Recognize that this is what CHF is, right? So if you can imagine, this is your capillary membrane, right? Or here's your capillary, here's your alveolus. And in normal people, these meet up. There's almost no space between your alveolus, your alveolar and capillary membranes. So that oxygen and carbon dioxide can freely go back and forth. In the setting of CHF, your, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure inside the blood vessels forces fluid out and into the interstitial space between the alveolus and the, uh, and the capillary. This is where the problem is 
is in this distance getting big. And then as the fluid builds up, it can collapse the alveolus from outside compression. And the rolls that you hear are them popping open and closed again, open and closed again. But once you get further upstream, there's nothing wrong with the bronchioles. So there is no wheezing. But with the $10 stethoscopes that most of us use, or in the back of a loud moving ambulance with road noise, I can't fault you for having difficulty in discriminating amongst the abnormal lung sounds, and especially in the patient who has diagnoses of CHF and COPD, right? So you can use your waveform as an objective marker to help. So with that, I'll end and leave plenty of room for, uh, for questions.